I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. It is a new week and the election is now eight days away with early voting now underway in many places across the country. President Biden is set to cast his ballot today in his home state of Delaware, joining the tens of millions who've already voted. Data from Target Smart, analyzed by NBC News's Decision Desk, shows that almost 43 million people have already cast their ballots, breaking the vote down by party. 42% of them are Democrats, while well, 40% are Republicans. It is slated to be a busy final full week of campaigning for both Vice President Harris and former President Trump. Harris will hold events today in Michigan, where Mr. Trump will be in the battleground state of Georgia. The former president hosted a controversial rally yesterday at a packed Madison Square Garden here in New York, not a battleground state. The rally is making big headlines. Mr. Trump's remarks were overshadowed by crude and racist remarks made by several speakers, including a stand-up comic who called Puerto Rico, quote, an island of garbage. Here's some of what was said. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah. I think it's called Puerto Rico. Okay. All right. Believe it or not, people, I welcome migrants to the United States of America with open arms. And by open arms, I mean like this. <laughs> it's wild. And these Latinos, they love making babies, too. Just know that. They do. They do. This is Donald Trump's house, brother. You know something, Trump maniacs? I don't see no stinking Nazis in here. I don't see no stinking domestic terrorists in here. The only thing I see in here are a bunch of hard-working men and women that are real Americans, brother. The United States is now an occupied country, but it will soon be an occupied country no longer. Not going to be happening. Not going to be happening. For the latest on the race for the White House, we're joined now by NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns, who's covering the Trump campaign, and NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba, who's covering Vice President Harris. Good morning to both of you. Dasha, let's begin with you and that Trump rally at Madison Square Garden. We just pay, played some of the controversial comments that were made throughout the day and evening at that rally. Explain to us the Trump campaign's decision to host an event with just over a week to go in a city that overwhelmingly votes Democratic and just what more you can tell us about these speakers, their questionable remarks, and how the former president's campaign is responding. So first of all, Joe, to that comedian, the Trump campaign almost immediately tried to distance themselves, saying in a statement that this joke does not reflect the Trump campaign's values wasn't specific about which uh, joke exactly they are talking about, but uh, plenty of Republicans also posted their own statements saying that they love Puerto Rico, that they disavow those comments. Uh, but, you know, this is kind of typical at a, at a Trump rally where some of the speakers earlier in the day in the pre-program will say pretty outlandish, controversial and offensive things. This is just a much bigger platform. And that was the whole point of this rally. I mean, the former president is a native New Yorker. He's always dreamed of packing in the garden, and that's what he did. Uh, but of course, that also means that it elevates some of those pre-program speakers and some of those uh, of offensive comments. Now, the former president himself actually mostly stuck to the script, his closing message being the economy and immigration. Of course, his rhetoric also escalatory when it comes to particularly that topic of immigration. You played some of those comments. He did also lean in to his past controversial comments talking about the enemy from within. And he repeated the line that is the sort of big picture closing message for the campaign, which is uh, that Harris broke it and he will fix it, Joe. All right, Monica, let's bring you in to talk about the Harris campaign. She spent yesterday with supporters in Philadelphia and also unveiled a policy plan aimed at helping Puerto Rico. Was that done as a response to those remarks we just heard from the Trump rally or was it already planned? And just in this pivotal weekend, what was her message to her base and to the undecided voters out there. 
Yeah, the timing was pretty significant here, Joe, because actually the vice president rolled that out hours before those comments were made, and she had spent time visiting a Puerto Rican restaurant and had put out a video about her policies and what she would do for the Puerto Rican community, of which there is a large one and a notable one in Pennsylvania in particular, and that's where she spent all of her day yesterday going from different local events and going to church and really trying to hammer out her closing message. And absolutely, you've heard now from the campaign and from a lot of the top surrogates and people like Puerto Rican superstar Bad Bunny, who has 45 million followers on Instagram, posting those comments that the vice president had put out about her own plan to try to put the attention in terms of her pitch to Puerto Ricans there, as opposed to those offensive comments made at the Trump rally, the Harris campaign said. But here's a little bit more of her overall closing message, which we're going to see every day for sure for the next eight. Listen. We have an opportunity before us to turn the page on the fear and the divisiveness that have characterized our politics for a decade because of Donald Trump. We have the ability to turn the page on that same old tired playbook because we are exhausted with it. There is too much on the line and we must not wake up the day after the election and have any regrets about what we could have done. So in this final stretch, there is definitely a big emphasis on what Donald Trump has said, what he's done. And you're really going to see that in stark display tomorrow uh, when the vice president speaks at the Ellipse near the White House, the site, of course, of where Donald Trump spoke on January 6th before the Capitol riot. Joe. Yeah, so we've recapped the weekend. Let's talk about what's ahead this week. Dasha, first with you, former President Trump slated to host cam hold campaign events in several battleground states places that will likely determine the election. What can you tell us about his week ahead? Yeah, he's blitzing pretty much all the battlegrounds, Joe. He'll be in Pennsylvania, of course, Georgia today, uh, Wisconsin, Nevada, New Mexico. But just as he hosted this massive event at uh, Madison Square Garden and notably not a swing state because he believes these sorts of events are, are high impact and they get attention, He's also headed on Saturday, just a few days before Election Day, to the state of Virginia, which he has claimed is in play, though it hasn't been in a long time for Republicans. It's not uh, in play according to the polls, but he believes he can win it. Again, those are the sorts of things that the campaign is strategically doing to try to draw a little bit of extra uh, attention to his campaign events, Joe. And Monica, you mentioned the speech at the Ellipse tomorrow. What all is ahead for Vice President Harris as she continues her campaign this week? So today she'll spend all of her time in Michigan. Tomorrow she'll be in D.C. for that major closing argument speech. And then on Wednesday, she's going to be hitting Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin all in one day. And then Thursday, she's going to head out west to campaign in Nevada and in Arizona. So exactly right now, the, the moment is all about hitting all the battlegrounds in as few days as possible. And you're going to be seeing Governor Tim Walz, the vice president's running mate, doing the same up until the very final day here. All right, Joe. Dasha and Monica kicking us off this hour. Thank you both. Speaking of running mates, former President Trump's running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, appeared on Meet the Press this weekend. He spoke about how another Trump administration would handle foreign and domestic affairs if elected. Vance was also pressed about how deeply his support of the former president ran if it came down to Mr. Trump versus the Constitution. Here's moderator Kristen Welker. Hello there, Joe. This week on Meet the Press, I spoke to former President Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, about where his loyalties lie if he has to choose between the Constitution and Donald Trump. Former Vice President Mike Pence said, quote, President Trump asked me to put him over my oath to the Constitution. Anyone who puts himself over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. Will your loyalty, Senator, be to the Constitution or to Donald Trump? Well, of course, my loyalty is to the American people and to the United States Constitution. But I think the Over best Donald way, Trump? the best way to accomplish that loyalty, Kristen, is to get back to a president who delivered the fastest rising take home pay in a generation, 1.5 percent inflation and a secure southern border. I don't think there's inconsistency between loyalty to the Constitution and support for Donald Trump. That's why I'm out there trying to persuade my fellow Americans that Donald Trump's presidency worked for them. And I'd like us to get back 
back to those smart Just policies. Just to put a very fine point on this, Mike Pence says Trump asked him to put Trump over the Constitution. If you find yourself in a similar position one day, will your loyalty be to the Constitution or to Donald J. Trump? I just said my loyalty, Kristen, is to the Constitution. You can see my full interview and a lot more at meetthepress.com. You can also get more Meet the Press here on NBC News Now every weekday at 4 p.m. All right, Kristen, thank you so much. So if this election is like 2020, then more than 155 million people will vote in the race for president. And yet the entire race will likely come down to the ballots of about 200,000 voters across seven battleground states. That's where the candidates are dedicating most of their time ahead of next week's election. So you might be wondering, how does such a big decision come down to such a small group? NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Julie Serkin explains. Hello to Georgia. I love you too. <laughs> we love you, last night. Of the 50 states that will tally votes this election day, voters in just seven of them are likely to determine the next president. Arizona, Michigan, Georgia, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. And if you live in one of these so-called battlegrounds, you are at the center of the political universe. Kamala Harris failed. Trump is not fit to be president again. With a lot of political power. Too many ads. Uh, I think we ought to put a limit on that. I hear it every day, 24-7. So why does a national race come down to just a handful of states? To answer that, we need to understand the Electoral College. And it's in large part thanks to... Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton and the Founding Fathers couldn't decide whether the people or Congress should choose the president. They eventually compromised, and in 1787, the Electoral College was born. Every state is given a number of electoral votes equal to its number of House members and senators in Congress. That totals 538, which is why the candidate who collects 270 electoral votes, one more than half, claims the presidency. It also means a candidate who loses the popular vote can still win the White House. It's already happened five times in U.S. history, including most recently to Donald Trump in 2016. With polling, the campaigns already have a very good sense of how people in more than 40 of the 50 states are going to vote. And both sides also know they have to find a few more electoral votes to win. It's about a few swing voters in a few swing counties located in a few swing states that are deciding the election. So in the 2024 race, Trump and Harris have zeroed in on the so-called significant seven, spending millions on rallies, TV ads and texts, trying to tip those states in their favor. So how should voters in the other 43 states feel going into the presidential election? They're probably feeling a little ignored. They shouldn't forget about Congress. They shouldn't forget about the House of Representatives, the Senate. Battlegrounds do shift over time. So it's not always the same swing states deciding the election. They need Florida. Florida, <laughs> Florida, Florida, Florida. In the 2000 election, it was all about Florida. Today, the Sunshine State is solidly red, with places like Pennsylvania and Georgia now in play. But in a nation of 350 million people from sea to shining sea, this election will hinge on the votes of a tiny fraction. This election is down to what about 150,000 to 200,000 voters are going to do across the seven states. Our thanks to Julie Serkin for that report. Now, after 2020, it took a few days of recounts and certifications before the winner was determined. This time around, officials say several states have streamlined workflows to try and process those early votes. Some states have also hired more poll workers and increased security. But once again, social media is playing a major role in this year's election, especially on TikTok, where some political videos are getting more than a billion views. Our own Savannah Sellers spoke to one researcher who says this kind of content is motivating the nation's youngest voters, Gen Z, to take action. I'm a never Trump guy. I'm a never Trump guy. I'm a never Across Trump TikTok, guy. political content is flooding feeds like never before. Did you vote? Are you gonna vote? Will you vote for me? Posts about Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump racking up 1.4 and 1.3 billion views, according to social media analytics company Zelf. Whether they're informational... Donald Trump and Kamala Harris just met for the very first time. Gonna or satirical. <laughs> no. No. 
Those videos likely to get in front of what could be a critical voting block this election. Gen Z, which made up nearly 45% of U.S. users on TikTok in 2023, according to market research company eMarketer. TikTok is such a powerful tool. And I think TikToker with, Melinda Hale um, first started posting during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement. Okay, real talk. Let's talk about the difference between what Kamala Harris wants to do for black men and what Trump wants to do. Her videos now often break down issues such as racial justice, reproductive health care, and climate change. I mean, I love being able to use my platform and use my voice to explain things that I care about in a way that is digestible for my followers and in a way that helps them understand, specifically with like policies that are happening in things to vote on for this election. Welcome back, Patriots. I'm your Some Gen Z TikTokers, Angel, like conservative creator Heaven Angel, like trying to reach their peers. As a Gen Z conservative, I'm going to tell you three reasons why I'm voting for Trump. She says her content reaches users on both ends of the political spectrum. Her message to the TikTok generation, one of unity. I think you're going to see within our generation, um, people that want to actually come together and find solutions rather than having problems to be able to campaign about because we're sick and tired of this. According to a new NBC News Stay Tuned poll of 18 to 29 year olds powered by SurveyMonkey, 77% of young voters believe the country is on the wrong track, up 10 points from August. The big question, will this generation turn out to vote? 58% say they will. I don't know what's wrong with you young people. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> Both the Harris and Trump campaigns turning to TikTok to try to turn out the vote, posting TikToks of campaign stops. President Trump! Well, that's a good-looking group. Hello, everybody. And embracing viral trends. What is your name as a group? The Click. That direct messaging, a way to reach voters on an app that has banned all political ads since 2019. But nonprofit Global Witness says it was able to get several ads with political disinformation approved by TikTok, raising questions about how well the platform is able to filter its content. A TikTok spokesperson telling us four ads were incorrectly approved during the first stage of moderation, but did not run on our platform. We do not allow political advertising and will continue to enforce this policy on an ongoing basis. Make some noise for my very good friend, Elon Musk. Musky. He has a lot of money, but not as much money as me. The type of content users are consuming on TikTok could prove critical. We were trying to see, well, maybe this is all just trivializing politics. Maybe this isn't really very informative or useful. We really didn't know what we would find. Researchers at Loyola Marymount University say the platform is motivating people to participate in politics, from watching more videos to donating and volunteering with campaigns in a way no other social media has. So I was surprised to see that it was actually seemingly having the effect of mobilizing people to take part in political action, which we say we want them to do. Go vote. Love y'all. Bye. Savannah Sellers, NBC News. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.